Hello class. Again, I'm reading from my home office and doing this lecture from here. Uh, you'll also notice me looking to my left quite a bit because this is where all my information is. That's what I'm using to actually give the lecture today. So if you see me like oddly looking back and forth, that's the reason I'm doing it. Today we're working on datums, mapping, pace, and compass, right? And that the lab for what we'll be doing for this week. Basically, we're diving in as if we're working on an actual dig in this class. Therefore, this is the first thing you'd be normally exposed to out in the field school, which would be the site itself, all right? So that's what we're going to be working with today and throughout this entire week. The first thing we may need to define is what's a datum. It's a fixed starting point of any scale or operation. For the purposes of this class, it's the fixed point in time and space when one begins a site inquiry or excavation. There are not too many things in archaeology that uh, are more important than the concept of the datum. Provenience, specifically, meaning knowing exactly where and when and at what depth and at what position, blah, 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 that you find in any given artifact. Simply put, provenience means origin, and I can't stress how imperative it is to catalog with absolute preciseness the information that comes from the datum and provenience of the given artifact or, fight, or feature you find. Pretty much nine, definitely. So everything starts with the datum. Fixed point in time and space where one begins as a site inquiry or excavation. The datum, as a fixed point, becomes, well, it comes an absolute measurement for the entire site as it's a fixed location that all other measurements that you're going to be doing on the site will be based off of. And that way you can create a map. If you have a fixed point in time and space, you're able to create a map of pretty much anything because you have a location that you can orient and say this is in this one given spot and that's basically what a datum does. Now there's three kinds of datum and if you look at the um, slide here in front of you we have the brass cap, the site datum, and the grid datum and we'll go over all three. Okay, The brass cap is basically a permanent location on the site that will not move. Usually it's set by a USS, USGS marker it's a fixed point that is known not only by location in two-dimensional space, but elevation is above sea level as well. When we say it's not going to move, this means that someone has picked this spot because it's a location like a big rock or a bridge or something of nature that is not going anywhere. And it's been there for probably 50 years. It's going to be been there for another 50, if not another 100 years. Like, think of a big rock out in the middle of the, of the desert, right, that is the size of a truck, okay? Obviously, it's not going anywhere. So if I'm going to pick a spot or a location to say, I want a fixed point in space that I absolutely know when I come back here 50, 50 years from now, or someone else comes back here 50 years from now, they can find it. So that's what they refer to as a brass cap. And if you look there on your screen for your... Um, your slide, you'll see one, the geological survey, that's what they refer to as a brass cap. It's a specific spot that they're saying 58 feet above sea level, the datum. And that's the location they say is an absolute, all right? In archaeology, we use these things. We may not put them down, but we can use them because that fixed point is a place that we can start from and say, I know exactly where that's at. I have that exactly mapped, all right, from, I go back to the records, whatever else, from USGS, and I can say that's an exact location, so I can base my measurements from there to my next thing I'm going to pull out, which is referred to as the site datum. This is the place, this is a, this is a stick, this is a metal piece of metal rebar, this is a location that I'm setting absolutely for the purposes of my entire survey site. Uh, all the measurements that I'm going to be doing for my entire survey and excavation will be based off of this specific datum. All right? And I'm going to place it usually closest to where we're going to think we're going to be doing this site survey or excavation. Basically, where is I think I'm going to get the best data from is the position that I'm going to stick my datum at. This is one I just created the other day. This is actually one we're going to use in class come Thursday. We're just going to drive this into the ground, all right, and orientate it, all right, and use this as 
the position or the where we're going to find all the other points on the map that we need to find, all right? This will be the site datum for the class lab. It's from this information, when we create that datum, we're able to, from this fixed point, we can able to set our, basically our third datum. And that third datum is the grid datum. The grid datum is basically when we start laying out the excavation grid, we start laying out the, the grid that we're going to be using to start digging up our holes, all right? Um, that's the fixed point that will be the start of where we start laying it out. If you think about any kind of, uh, if you've ever done XY coordinates in mathematics, if you've ever done this, all right, any kind of graphing in high school, all right, if you think about that XY coordinates, the, the cross in the center of the XY, the very dead center, zero, zero, of that XY coordinate map, all right, you have in front of you is that position we're talking about. That's the grid datum. And that would be located, as far as we're concerned, in the southwest corner of our survey area. All right, meaning basically of the entire XY coordinate uh, map we have in front of us. It would be the northeast quadrant of that area. We're looking at where we would set that datum point that first one where everything else would be measured off of it from that position would be the southwest corner all right or zero zero and everything would pursue it would proceed from there then as we go on the excavation site will be first further segmented into smaller squares within that grid as we go now a service survey is basically going out to a given area that we're wanting to look for our data look for artifacts look for features look for changes in the ground and we're going to go out there and map it and mapping actually is not as difficult as one might think right it doesn't require necessarily an entire survey set of equipment even though that's nice to have all right we don't need that as archaeologists as per se we, we, we can use it we can use total station and things like nature to do these kinds of things but in truth when we're talking about areas that are really, really wide and large, we're talking about massive areas that are like anywhere between 10 to 15, 30 miles wide that we may want to be surveying. Um, based on that alone, we're going to have to come up with new and interesting ways to do things besides pull out a tape measure, all right? Because there's no tape measures that are 20, 30 miles long, obviously, all right? Well, we're going to use GPS, we're going to use LIDAR, we're going to use Map and Compass, or we're going to use another tool too called uh, uh, pace, and, uh, by pace Counting. And I'm going to explain that a little, a little bit as we go. One of the most common methods we use for mapping is electronic survey methods, which are low position satellites, ground penetrating radar, all right, which runs over the ground and we're penetrating down or right, to see what's underneath the soil, and of course LIDAR. <laughs> and LIDAR is light detention and detention and ranging. Basically, they are shooting lasers and light directly into jungle canopies, all right, to see what's up underneath it, the, the canopies themselves, right? And we get some really surprising results from that. But again, those techniques don't work in every environment. I'm going to give you an example of one that don't work in right now. This is Guatemala. LIDAR gave us an impressive array of information from this for us to see an entire area here that was underneath the jungle canopy that was vast an entire city that was underneath there and it was great that we could find these things finally and start learning to map them but lidar is not going to give us exact measurements that we'd only be able to take on the ground we can see these things all right as the computer lays them out all right but the exact measurements for let's say a temple or a feature or any given artifact that we find on the ground, any piece of flint, any piece of uh, a projectile point, everything else, and where specifically we find these things and the size of doors and whatever else, these are all things that have to be done on the ground level. And it, when you're talking about an area, if you look how hilly that is and how the terrain is set up, all right, this is something that's going to be very difficult to do two-dimensionally. So we have to be able to understand how angles work, 
We had to understand how the ground moves up and down. We had to also understand uh, the distances that we're dealing with, right, are, are just vast. So, again, trying to bring in tape measures to cover areas that are 20, 30 kilometers wide, right, are just not capable of doing. So what we do, actually, is this technique I'm fixing to show you right now, pace and compass. It's the most common technique that's been used by archaeologists and surveyors and cartographers for centuries. Um, it can be accurate in the macro for use of wide open areas, even large areas, even with using GPS. And the easiest method to use without having to own a tape measure that is, again, hundreds of meters long. Right? And what you basically we're doing is that we are figuring out based on our stride how long our strides are uh, starting from the beginning be able to take one step out and then the next on every step we drop our left foot we'll count those all right and then work out exactly how long those strides are and we take an average of that over a period like say 50 meters all right and that way we're able to work out mathematically pretty much exactly what the, what the distances are for us. For me, it's uh, 33 centimeters. And I can use that as a kind of a base to say, okay, half of that or one fourth of that based on where I stop at and get a pretty good idea of, now this is again ballparking, a pretty good idea of the distance that I traveled, all right? And then use that to create a map. And we're going to be doing that this week and next week both, all right, for for uh, mapping as well on next week because next week we're going to be doing laying out <clears throat> the grid itself in the uh, the grid itself and, and how to specifically lay out the, the blocks for uh, digging. As we learn to do this, we're going to learn through this lab how specifically to start from a datum point, whether that's specifically the, the site datum, and use a compass, all right, and be able to use this compass and be able to figure out exactly what your bearing is that you're trying to get to, all right? And then walk that area to that specific point, all right? And then mark it down at how many steps I took to get there. And from that information, be able to work out the exact, bit, pretty as close as you can, the distances from the datum, the site datum, to the location. And we're gonna do that this week using Again, this datum stuck in the ground, and then we'll put some flags out, roughly six of them across the uh, quad out there, and we're going to use that to to do the entire do the entire uh, lab that way. And also, we're going to map the whole quadrangle uh, on the southern side of it from the basically the pillars back to Jesse Hall. Don't worry about it. I'm going to show you how to do everything that required the uh, the actual uh, assignment has all the materials you're going to need. You'll have a compass array. Right? You'll have all everything you could possibly need to be able to do this. And this is our site. Uh, we're mapping the quadrangle. Um, we're going to try to provide a map by way of pace and compass to get the entire area. And uh, again, you can provide a graph paper, ruler, compasses, practitioners, everything to finish the lab, right? And I'm going to be doing this right along with you. You should not have any problems at all doing this, right? I'm going to show you everything step by step on how we do this. One of the things I want to reiterate, though, that I said this in the assignment, I'm going to say it now again. If you have the capability of getting yourself a tape measure, if you have the capability to get yourself a tape measure, if you have that handy or you have some way, like you have access to um, a track or something like that, and you can work out exactly what 50 meters is on that track or work it out by way of a tape measure. Uh, one meter on a tape measure is approximately uh, 39 and 3 8 inches. Um, if you can work that out and work yourself out a uh, course for yourself before Thursday and figure out exactly what your pace is and the how you do it is given in the assignment as well. Um, and have that in your pocket before you show up to class, that'd be great. 
because we have only 50 minutes in the class and we're going to run everybody through this as fast as we can. And then you'll be taking all that data and compiling it and sending it to me. Um, if you don't get that done before then, I will have a course set up on the quadrangle for you to walk it. There'll be a 50 meter increment course there and you can walk it from point A to point B and back, all right, and then work out the math yourself, all right? And again, in the assignment, you'll find all the information you need for that, as well, that too. Um, but once we get started, we're going to see if we can get through everybody, do through all six locations, all right, and get all the information we possibly need to create our maps. And we should, and I'm going to go over how to use the compass, all right? I'm also going to show you how to get use one of these, too. The difference between, a lot of people see these two different kinds of compasses out there. This one is basically referred to as a, uh, we used to call it, when I was in the military, we would call it all these ranger compasses. And uh, the actual uh, terminology for them is, uh, I'll tell you, read you right off the box. It's uh, uh, basically a, a navigation or camping compass, all right? You'll see Boy Scouts use these quite often, and they're pretty good, all right? This is a cheap one. Some of the more expensive ones, expensive ones like the, the, the Ranger Silvas go as much as $20 a pop. I got these for like uh, a couple of bucks, and I've got six to work with for the class, right? If you have your own, and you, if you do, you usually will have something like this, all right? Um, pre, please bring that. Uh, this is referred to as an engineering compass. And this is the type that I used, was familiar with from the military. Uh, we call these pocket compasses when I was in the service, right? Ranger pocket. And uh, these are also fairly easy to use, all right? Both of them work for what we're doing, all right? If you have either one, please bring with you to class, all right? And I'll show you how to use both for what we're doing. Should be no problem at all. Um, believe it or not, this is actually a lot of fun. This particular uh, this particular uh, uh, lab. This is one of the things that I, I love doing because of my background in service and as a police officer. Is I did a lot of tracking whenever I was a cop, or right? and I also did this kind of work specifically in the service as well. So for me, this is a lot of fun, and I'm I hope that you guys can get a lot of uh, out of it too. And so I'll tell you what, hopefully this all will be work out great, and I will see you on Thursday. So you guys have a good day, and make sure and try to get that pace in, that, that pace in before we start on Thursday. If you can't, it'll be laid out for you. And uh, everything should be, you should have everything to start your lab on Thursday when you get there. So have a great day.